All right, I am I'm half an hour late. <laughs> uh, sorry, um, but here we are. Oh God. I am pretty beat up. Um, I overdid it this week. The gym and then fencing and then Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and then aerial rope. And someone uh, put their weight on my ankle during BJJ, which is fine. It's just going to hurt while it heals. Let's see. Here's where we were. But anyway, I am very physically tired. <clears throat> so I got home from rope and ate a little bit and then laid down intending to just rest for five minutes and then it became 30. <laughs> so I, yeah, here I am now though. We left off with uh, Redrick um, heading to the Metropole Hotel for some sort of business. Uh, well, we know it's business to do with the artifacts. He just got out of the zone while carrying Buzzard, whose legs had been eaten off by the... Uh, or destroyed, the bones had been destroyed by the witch's jelly. He ran into Richard Noonan, who uh, told him that he's doing work automating for the Institute. Might have a job for... Might have a job for Red. Red seemed anxious to get rid of him. And eventually Richard bailed, and that's where we left off. Well, then Red took the elevator up after having sort of like a, an episode in the street. Um, and that's where we left off. <clears throat> so let's keep going. Can we just let's take like 30 seconds? I'm going to drink some water, see if anyone pops in, and then we'll get started. Okay. <clears throat> the last sentence we left off with was, Redrick pushed open the door to 874 without knocking. Throaty, sitting on a table by the window, was performing a ritual over a cigar. He was still in his pajamas, and his thinning hair, though wet, was carefully parted. His unhealthy, puffy face was smoothly shaved. Aha, he said without looking up. A punctuality is the politeness of kings. A good day, young man. He finished clipping the end of the cigar, took it in both hands, brought it up to his nose and passing it back and forth under it. I'm sorry, and passed it back and forth under it. Where is good old Burbridge? He asked and looked up. His eyes were clear, blue, angelic. Redrick put the briefcase on the sofa, sat down, and took out his cigarettes. Burbridge isn't coming. Good old Burbridge, Throaty repeated. He took the cigar between two fingers and carefully brought it to his mouth. Old Burbridge's nerves are acting up. He kept looking at Redrick with his clear blue eyes, never blinking. He never blinked. The door opened slightly, and Bones slipped into the room. Who were you talking to? he asked from the doorway. Ah, oh, hello, Redrick said cheerily, flipping ashes on the floor. Bones shoved his hands in his pockets and came closer, taking broad steps with his huge, pigeon-toed feet. He stopped in front of Redrick. We've told you a hundred times, he reproached him. No contacts before a meeting, and what do you do? I say hello, Redrick replied. And you? Throaty laughed. Bones was irritated. Hello, hello, hello. He removed his reproachful gaze from Redrick and flung himself down on the couch next to him. 
You cannot behave that way. Do you understand me? You cannot. Then arrange meetings in places where I don't know anybody. The boy is right, Throaty interjected. Our mistake. So who was that man? Richard Noonan. He represents some companies that supply the Institute. He lives here in the hotel. You see how simple it is, Throaty said to Bones. He picked up a colossal lighter shaped like the Statue of Liberty, looked at it doubtfully, and replaced it on the table. Where's Burbridge? Throaty asked in a friendly tone. Burbridge blew it. The two men exchanged a quick glance. Rest in peace, Throaty said tensely. Or has he been arrested? Redrick didn't answer right away, taking slow, long drags on his cigarette. He threw the butt on the floor. Don't worry, everything's safe. He's in the hospital. That's some safe, Bones said nervously. He jumped up and went over to the window. Which hospital? Don't worry, everything's taken care of. Let's get down to business. I'm sleepy. What hospital specifically? Bones asked in irritation. I've told you. Redrick picked up the briefcase. Are we doing business today or not? We are, we are, son, Throaty said heartily. With unexpected agility, he leaped to the floor, knocked all of the magazines and newspapers from the coffee table, and sat in front of it, resting his hairy pink hands on his knees. Show your stuff! Redrick opened the briefcase, took out the list with prices, and put it on the table before Throaty. Throaty glanced at it and flicked it to the side, Bones stood behind him and started reading the list over his shoulder. That's the bill, Redrick said. I see. Uh, let's see the stuff, Throaty said. The money, Redrick said. What's this hoop? Bones asked suspiciously, pointing at the list over Throaty's shoulder. Redrick said nothing. He was holding the open briefcase on his lap and staring into the blue angelic eyes. Throaty finally chuckled. "'And why do I love you so much, my son?' he muttered. "'And they say love at first sight doesn't exist?' He sighed dramatically. "'Phil, buddy, how do they say it here? Dole out the cabbage, lay some greenbacks on him, and give me a match, you see?' He waved his cigar at him. Phil the Bones muttered something under his breath, tossed him a book of matches, and went through a curtain into the next room. Redrick could hear him talking to someone there, irritated and indistinct, something about the cat being in the bag, and Throaty, his pale lips, I'm sorry, and Throaty, his cigar finally lit, kept staring at Redrick with a frozen smile on his thin, pale lips. Redrick, chin on briefcase, was looking at him and also trying not to blink, even though his lids were burning and his eyes were tearing. Bones came back, threw two packs of money on the table, and sat next to Redrick in a huff. Redrick lazily reached for the money, but Throaty motioned him to stop, tore the wrappers from the money, and put them in his pajama pocket. Now, let's see it. Redrick took the money and stuffed it into his inner jacket pocket without counting it. Then he presented his wares. He did it slowly, letting both of them examine the swag and check items off the list. It was quiet in the room. The only sound was Throaty's heavy breathing and the jingle coming from the other room, a spoon against the side of a glass, perhaps. When Redrick shut the briefcase and clicked the lock, Throaty looked up at him. What about the most important thing? No way, Redrick replied. He thought and added, So far. I like that so far, Throaty said gently. How about you, Phil? You're throwing dust in our eyes, Shoeheart, Bones said suspiciously. Why the mystery, I ask you? That comes with the territory, shady dealings. Redrick said. We're in a demanding profession. All right, all right, Throaty said. 
Where's the camera? Hell! Redrick scratched his cheek, feeling the color rise in his face. I'm sorry. I forgot all about it. There? Throaty, a throaty asked, making a vague gesture with the cigar. I don't remember. Probably there. Redrick shut his eyes and leaned back on the couch. Nope. I clean forgot. Too bad, Throaty said. But you at least saw the thing. Not even that, Redrick said sadly. That's the whole point. We didn't get as far as the blast furnaces. Burbridge fell into the jelly, and I had to head back immediately. You could be sure that if I'd seen it, I wouldn't have forgotten it. Hey, you! Look at this! Bones whispered in fright. What's this? He stuck out his right index finger. The white metal hoop was twirling around his finger, and Bones was staring pop-eyed at the hoop. It's not stopping, he said aloud, moving his eyes from the loop to Throaty and back again. What do you mean it's not stopping? Throaty asked carefully and moved away. I put it on my finger and gave it a spin just for the hell of it, and it hasn't stopped for a whole minute. Bones jumped up and, holding his finger extended before him, ran behind the curtain. The silvery hoop twirled smoothly in front of him like a propeller. What the hell did you bring us? Throaty asked. God knows, I had no idea. If I had, I'd have asked more for it. Throaty stared at him, then got up and went behind the curtain. Voices started babbling immediately. Redrick picked up a magazine from the floor and flipped through it. It was chock full of beauties, but somehow they nauseated him just then. Redrick's eyes roved around the room, looking for something to drink. Then he took a pack from his inside pocket and counted the bills. Everything was in order, but to keep from falling asleep, he counted the other one. Just as he was putting it back into his pocket, Throaty came back. You're lucky, son he announced, sitting opposite Redrick once more. Do you know what a perpetuum mobile is? Nope, we never studied that. And you don't need to, Throaty said. He pulled out another pack. That's the price for the first specimen, he said, pulling off the wrapping. For each new one, you'll get two packs like this. Got it, son? Two apiece but only on the condition that no one except you and I ever know about it. Are we agreed? Redrick put the money in his pocket silently and stood up. I'm going, he said. When and where for the next time? Brody also rose. You'll be called. Wait for a call every Friday between 9 and 9.30 in the morning. You'll get regards from Phil and Hugh, and a meeting will be set up. Redrick nodded and headed for the door. Throaty followed and put his hand on his shoulder. I want you to understand one thing, he continued. All oh, this is very nice, charming, and so on, and the hoop is simply marvelous. But above all, we need two things, the photos and the container filled up. Return our camera to us, but with exposed film, and our porcelain container, but not empty, filled and you'll never have to go into the zone again. Redrick shook Throaty's hand from his shoulder, unlocked the door, and went out. Without turning, he walked down the thickly carpeted hallway and sensed the unwavering, blue, angelic gaze fixed on the back of his neck. He didn't wait for the elevator, but walked down from the eighth floor. Outside the Metropole, he called a cab and went to the other side of town. The driver was a new one, someone Redrick didn't know, a beak-nosed, pimply fellow, one of the hundreds that had poured into Harmont in the last few years to look for exciting adventures, untold riches, world fame, or some special religion. They poured in and ended up as chauffeurs, <laughs> chauffeurs, construction workers, or thugs, thirsting, wretched, tortured by vague desires, profoundly disillusioned, and certain that they had been tricked once again. Half of them, after hanging around for a month or two, returned to their homes, cursing and spreading the word of their disillusionment to all the countries of the world. 
A very few became stalkers and quickly perished before they had caught on to the tricks of the trade. Some managed to get a job at the Institute, but only the best educated and smartest of them who could at least work as lab assistants. The rest wasted evening after evening in bars, brawled over some difference of opinion, girls or just because they were drunk, and drove the municipal police, the army, and the guards out of their mind. The pimply driver reeked of liquor a mile away, and his eyes were rabbit red, but he was very excited and told Redrick how that morning a stiff from the cemetery showed up on their block. He came back to his house, and the house had been locked up for years, and everyone had moved. His widow, an old lady now, and his daughters, and her husband, and their children. He had died, the neighbor said, some thirty years ago, that is, before the visitation, and now there he was. He walked around the house, sniffed and scratched, and then sat by the fence and waited. People came round from the whole neighborhood. They stared and stared, but were afraid, of course, to come close. Finally, somebody got a bright idea. They broke open the door to his house, making an entrance for him. And what do you think? He got up, went in, shut the door behind him. I was late for work, so I don't know how it turned out, but I do know that they were planning to call the Institute and have someone come over there and get him the hell out of there. Stop, Redrick said. Let me get off right here. He rummaged in his pocket. He had no change and had to break a new bill. Then he stood in the doorway and waited for the cab to drive away. Buzzard's cottage wasn't too bad. Two stories, a glassed-in veranda with a pool table, a well-tended garden, a greenhouse, and a white gazebo under the apple trees. A filigree iron fence painted light green surrounded it all. Redrick pushed the bell several times, and the gate swung open with a creak, and Redrick slowly moved up the, the shady path with rose bushes planted along the edges. Hamster was already standing on the porch. He was gnarled, black and trembling, with the desire to be of service. Impatiently, he turned sideways, lowered one trembling leg in search of support, steadied himself, and dragged the other foot to meet its mate. His right arm shook convulsively in Redrick's direction, as if to say, Coming! Coming! Any minute! Hey, Red! A woman's voice called from the garden. Redrick turned his head and saw bare tanned shoulders, a bright red mouth, and a waving hand among the greenery next to the lacy white roof of the gazebo. He nodded to Hamster, turned from the path, and breaking through the rose bushes, headed for the gazebo along the soft green grass. A large red mat was spread on the lawn, and Dina Burbridge was sitting regally on it with a glass in her hand and a minuscule bathing suit on her body. A book with a bright cover lay on the mat, and an ice bucket with a slender bottleneck peering over the edge sat in the shade nearby. "'I read,' Dina Burbridge said, greeting him with a wave of the glass. "'Where's the old man? Don't tell me he's messed up again.' Redrick stood over her with the briefcase in his hands behind his back. Yes, Buzzard sure managed to wish himself up some marvelous children out there in the zone. She was all silk and satin, firm and full, flawless without a single unnecessary wrinkle, a hundred and twenty pounds of sugar candy flesh, and emerald eyes that had an inner glow, a large wet mouth and even white teeth, and raven hair shining in the sun and carelessly tossed over one shoulder. The sun was caressing her, pouring from her shoulders to her belly and hips, leaving deep shadows between her almost naked breasts. He stood above her and looked her over openly, and she looked up at him, laughing understandingly, and then raised the glass to her lips and took several sips. "'You want?' she asked, licking her lips. She waited just long enough for him to get the double entendre, and then handed him the glass." He turned and looked until he found a chaise lounge in the shade. He sat down and stretched his legs. Burbridge is in the hospital, he said. They're going to amputate his legs. Still smiling, she looked at him with one eye. The other was covered by the heavy hair that fell over her shoulder, but her smile had frozen, a sugary grin on a tan face. Then she swirled the glass listening to the tinkle of the ice cubes. Both, 
legs? Both. Maybe below the knees, maybe above. She put down the glass and pushed back her hair. She was no longer smiling. Too bad, she said. And that means you... Dina Burbridge was the one person he could have told how it happened in all the details. He could even have told her how they drove. Uh, bleh. <laughs> he could have even told her how they drove back, his brass knuckles ready, and how Burbridge had begged, not for himself even, but for the children, for her, and for Archie, and promised him the golden ball. But he didn't tell her. He pulled out a pack of money from his breast pocket and tossed it onto the red mat, right at her long, naked legs. The notes fanned out in a rainbow. Dina absent-mindedly picked up several and examined them as though she had never seen one before, but wasn't that interested. This is the last earnings, then, she said. Redrick leaned over from the chaise lounge and pulled the bottle from the ice bucket. He looked at the label. Water was dripping along the dark glass, and Redrick held the bottle away from himself so as not to drip on his pants. He did not like expensive whiskey, but he could force himself to have a slug at a time like this. He was just about to put the bottle to his mouth when he was stopped by indistinct sounds of protestation behind him. He looked around and saw that Hamster was painfully dragging his feet across the lawn, holding a glass of clear liquid in both hands. The exertion was making the sweat pour off his dark, wooly head, and his bloodshot eyes had practically popped out of their sockets. When he saw that Redrick was looking at him, he extended the glass in despair and sort of mooed and howled, opening his toothless mouth ineffectually. "'I'll wait, I'll wait,' Redrick said, and shoved the bottle back in the bucket. Hamster finally limped over gave Redrick the glass and patted his shoulder shyly with his arthritic hand. "'Thanks, Dixon,' Redrick said seriously. "'That's just what I need right now. "'As usual, you're right on top of things.' And while Hamster shook his head in embarrassment and rapture and convulsively slapped himself on the hip with his good arm, Redrick raised the glass, nodded to him, and gulped down half. Then he looked at Dina. "'You want?' he asked, meaning the glass. She did not reply. She was folding a bill in half, and in half once again, and then again. "'Cut it out,' he said. "'You won't be lost, your old man.' She interrupted him. "'And so you dragged him out,' she said. She wasn't asking. She was stating a fact." You carried him, you jerk, through the whole zone, you red-headed cretin. You dragged that bastard on your backbone, you ass. You blew an opportunity like that. He was watching her, his glass forgotten. She got up and stood in front of him, walking over the scattered money, and stopped, her clenched fists jammed into her smooth hip, blocking out the entire world for him with her marvelous body, smelling of perfume and sweet sweat. He's got all of you idiots wrapped around his finger. He'll walk all over your bones. Just wait and see. He'll walk on your thick skulls on crutches. He'll show you the meaning of brotherly love and mercy. She was screaming. I'll bet he promised you the golden ball, right? The map? The traps, right? Jerk, I can see by your dumb face that he did. Just wait. He'll give you a map. Lord have mercy on the soul of the red-headed fool, Redrick Shuhart. Redwick got up slowly and slapped her face hard. She shut up, sank to the grass, and buried her face in her hands. You fool, Red, she muttered, to blow an opportunity like that. Redrick looked down at her and finished the vodka. He thrust it at Hamster without looking at him. There was nothing to talk about. Some fine kids Burbridge conjured up in the zone, loving and respectful. He went into the street and hailed a cab. He told the driver to go to the borscht. He had to finish up his affairs. He was dying for sleep. Everything was swimming before his eyes, and he fell asleep in the cab. His body slumped over the briefcase and awoke only when the driver shook him. We're here, mister. Where are we? He looked around. 
I told you the bank. No way, buddy. You said the borscht. Here's the borscht. Okay, Redrick grumbled. I must have dreamed it. He paid up and got out, barely able to move his heavy legs. The asphalt was steaming in the sun, and it was very hot. Redrick realized that he was soaked, that there was a bad taste in his mouth, and that his eyes were tearing. He looked around before going in. As usual, at this time of day, the street was deserted. Businesses weren't open yet, and the borscht was supposed to be closed too, but Ernest was at his post already, wiping glasses and giving dirty looks to the trio sopping up beer at the corner table. The chairs had not been removed from the other tables. An unfamiliar porter in a white jacket was mopping the floor, and another was struggling with a case of beer behind Ernest. Redrick went up to the bar, put the briefcase on the bar, and said hello. Ernest muttered something that was not exactly welcoming. Give me a beer, Redrick said, and yawned convulsively. Ernest slammed an empty mug on the table, grabbed a bottle from the refrigerator, opened it, and upended it over the mug. Redrick, covering his mouth with his hand, stared at Ernest's hand. It was trembling. The bottle hit the edge of the mug several times. Redrick looked up at Ernest's face. His heavy eyelids were lowered, his puffy mouth twisted, and his fat cheeks drooping. The porter was mopping right under Redrick's feet. The guys in the corner were arguing loudly over the races, and the other porter with the crates backed into Ernest so hard that he reeled. The man mumbled an apology. Ernest spoke in a cramped voice. Did you bring it? Bring what? Redrick looked over his shoulder. One of the guys stood up lazily and went to the door. He stopped in the doorway to light a cigarette. Let's go talk, Ernest said. The porter with the mop was now also between Redrick and the door. A big black man along the lines of Gutalan, but twice as broad. Let's go. Redrick said and picked up the briefcase. He did not feel sleepy anymore in either eye. He went behind the bar and squeezed past the porter with the cases of beer. The porter had apparently caught his finger. He was sucking his fingertip and watching Redrick. He was a big fellow with a broken nose and cauliflower ears. Ernest went into the back room and Redrick followed him because now the three guys from the corner table were blocking the door, and the porter with the mop was standing near the curtains that led to the storeroom. In the back room, Ernest stepped aside and sat on a chair by the wall. Captain Corderblad, yellow and angry, stood up from the table. From somewhere on the left, a huge UN trooper appeared, his helmet pulled down over his eyes, and quickly frisked him with his large hands. He slowed down at his right pocket and extracted the brass knuckles. He prodded Redrick in the captain's direction. Redrick approached the table and set the briefcase in front of Captain Quarterblad. You bloodsucker, he said to Ernest. Ernest raised his eyebrows and shrugged one shoulder. It was all clear. The two porters in the doorway were smirking, and there were no other doors, and the window was barred from the outside. Captain Quarterblad, his face contorted by disgust, was digging around with both hands in the briefcase and taking out the swag and putting it on the table. Two small empties, nine batteries, various sizes of black sprays, sixteen pieces in a polyethylene package, two perfectly preserved sponges, and one jar of carbonated clay. "'Anything in your pockets?' Captain Quarterblad asked softly. "'Empty them.' "'Snakes!' Redrick said, Skunks! He pulled out a pack of bills and flung it on the table. They scattered. Aha! The captain said. Any more? Lousy toads! Redrick shouted and threw the second pack on the floor. There you go. I hope you choke on it. Very interesting, the captain said calmly. Now pick it up. The hell I will, Redrick said, putting his hands behind his back. Your slaves will pick it up. You can pick it up yourself for all I care. Uh, pick up the money, stalker, 
Captain Quarterblad said, without raising his voice, leaning his fist on the table and straining toward Redrick. They stared at each other for a few seconds, and then Redrick, muttering curses under his breath, crouched down and reluctantly set about picking up the money. The porters were snickering behind his back, and the UN trooper snorted gleefully. Don't snort at me, Redrick said. You'll lose your snot. He was crawling around on his hands and knees, picking up the notes one by one, moving closer and closer to the dark brass ring lying peacefully on the dusty parquet floor. He turned to get better access. He kept shouting obscenities, all the ones he could remember and ones he was making up along the way. When the moment was right, he shut up, tensed, grabbed the ring, pulled it up with all his strength, and before the open trapdoor landed on the floor, he had jumped head first into the gray, cold prison of the wine cellar. He fell on his hands, somersaulted, jumped up, and ran hunched over, seeing nothing, counting on his memory and luck into the narrow passageway between cases of bottles, knocking them over as he went past, hearing them fall and shatter in the passage behind him. Slipping, he ran up some invisible steps, threw his body against the door with its rusty hinges, and found himself in Ernest's garage. He was shaking and panting. There were bloody spots swimming before his eyes, and his heart was beating heavily with strong jolts right in his throat. But he did not stop for a second. He ran to the far corner, and scraping his hands, tore into the mountain of garbage that hid the place where the boards had been removed from the wall. He lay down on his stomach and crawled through, hearing his jacket tear, and when he was out in the narrow courtyard, he crouched down behind the garbage cans, pulled off his jacket, threw away his tie, gave himself a quick once-over, brushed off his pants, straightened up, and ran into the yard. He dove into a low, smelly tunnel that led to the next courtyard. He listened for the whine of the police sirens as he ran, but there weren't any yet, and he ran faster, scaring playing children, dodging hanging laundry, crawling through holes and rotten fences, trying to get out of the neighborhood as fast as possible before Captain Quarterblad could cordon it off. He knew the area very well. He had played in all the yards and cellars, the abandoned laundries and the coal cellars. He had plenty of acquaintances and even friends here, and under different circumstances he would have had no trouble in hiding out, even for a week in the neighborhood. But he hadn't made a daring escape from arrest under Captain Cordoblad's very nose, adding an easy twelve months to his sentence just for that. He was very lucky. On 7th Street, a parade of some brotherhood or other was making raucous progress down the street. Two hundred of them, just as disheveled and filthy as he was, some looked worse, as though they had spent the evening crawling through holes and fences, spilling the contents of garbage cans on themselves, maybe after having spent the night rowdily in a coal bin. He ducked out of a doorway into the crowd, cutting across it, pushing and shoving, stepping on feet, getting an occasional fist in his face and returning the favor, until he broke out on the other side of the street and ducked into another doorway. Just then... A familiar, disgusting wail of the patrol cars resounded, and the parade came to a grinding halt, folding up like an accordion. But he was in a different neighborhood now, and Captain Quarterblad had no way of knowing which one. He approached his own garage from the side of the radio and electronics store, and he had to wait a while. I'm sorry, and he had to wait while the workmen loaded a van with television sets. He made himself comfortable in the ragged lilac bushes by the windowless side of the neighboring houses, caught his breath, and had a cigarette. He smoked greedily, crouching down and leaning against the rough fireproof wall, touching his cheek from time to time, trying to still the nervous tick. He thought and thought and thought. When the van with the workers pulled away, honking into the driveway, he laughed and said softly after them, Thanks, boys. You held up this fool and let me think. He started moving quickly, but without rushing, cleverly and premeditatedly, like he worked in the zone. He entered his garage through the hidden passage, noiselessly lifted the old seat, carefully pulled the roll of paper from the bag in the basket, and slipped it inside his shirt. He took an old, worn leather jacket from a hook, found a greasy cap in the corner, and pulled it down over his eyes. The cracks in the door let narrow rays of light with dancing dust into the gloomy garage, and kids were yelling and playing outside. As he was leaving, he heard his daughter's voice, put his eye against the widest crack, 
and watched Monkey wave two balloons and run around the swings. Three old women with knitting in their laps were sitting on a nearby bench, watching her with pursed lips, exchanging their lousy opinions, the dried-up hags. The kids were fine, playing with her as though she were just like them. It was worth all the bribery. He built them a slide and a dollhouse and the swings and the bench that the old biddies were on. All right, he said, tore himself away from the crack, looked around the garage one more time, and crawled into the hole. In the southwest part of town, near the abandoned gas station at the end of Miner Street, there was a phone booth. One sec. Sorry. <laughs> I had to go back to the music I'm allowed to play. Should be on repeat, but it's not. <clears throat> In the southwest part of town, near the abandoned gas station at the end of Miner Street, there was a phone booth. God only knew who used it nowadays. All the houses around it were boarded up, and beyond it was the seemingly endless, empty lot that used to be the town dump. Redrick sat down in the shade of the booth and stuck his hand into the crack below it. He felt the dusty wax paper and the handle of the gun wrapped in it. The lead box of bullets was there too, as well as the bag with the bracelets and the old wallet with fake documents. His hiding place was in order. Then, he took off his jacket and cap and felt inside his shirt. He sat for a minute or more, hefting in his hand the porcelain container and the invincible and inevitable death it contained, and he felt the nervous tick come back. "'Shoe hearts,' he muttered, not hearing his own voice. "'What are you doing, you snake? You scum! They can kill us all with this thing!' He held his twitching cheek but it didn't help. Bastards, he said about the workers who had been loading the TV sets. You got in my way. I would have thrown it back into the zone, the bitch, and it would have been all over. He looked around sadly. The hot air was shimmering over the cracked cement. The boarded up windows looked at him gloomily and the tumbleweeds rolled around the lot. He was alone. All right, he said decisively. Every man for himself. Only God takes care of everybody. I've had it. Hurrying so as not to change his mind, he stuffed the container into the cap, wrapped the cap in the jacket. Then he got on his knees and leaned against the booth. It moved. The bulky package fit in the bottom of the pit under the booth with room to spare. He carefully replaced the booth, shook it to see how steady it was, and got up, brushing off his hands. That's it. It's settled. He got into the heat of the phone booth, deposited a coin, and dialed. Guta, he said, please don't worry. They caught me again. He could hear her shuddering sigh. He quickly added, it's a minor offense. Six to eight months with visiting rights. We'll manage, and you'll have money. They'll send it to you. She was still silent. Tomorrow morning, they'll call you down to the command post. We'll see each other then. Bring Monkey. Will there be a search? She asked. Let them. The house is clean. Don't worry. Keep your tail up. You know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. You married a stalker, so don't complain. See you tomorrow. And remember, I didn't call. I kiss your little nose. He hung up abruptly and stood for a few seconds, eyes shut and teeth clenched so tightly there was a tingling in his ears. Then he deposited another coin and dialed another number. Listening, said Throaty. It's Shoeheart. Listen carefully and don't interrupt. Shoeheart? What Shoeheart? asked Throaty in a natural manner. Don't interrupt, I said. They caught me. I ran, and I'm going to turn myself in now. I'm going to get two and a half or three years. My wife will be penniless. You take care of her, so that she needs nothing. Understand? Understand, I said. Go on, said Throaty. Not far from the place where we first met, there's a phone booth. It's the only one. You won't mistake it. 
The porcelain is under it. If you want it, take it. If you don't, don't. But my wife must be taken care of. We still have many years of playing together. If I come back and found out and find out you double-crossed me, well, I don't suggest that you do. Understand? I understand everything, said Throaty. Thanks. After a pause, he asked, Maybe you want a lawyer? No, said Redrick. Every last cent goes to my wife. My regards. He hung up, looked around, dug his hands into his pants pockets, and slowly went up Minor Street between the empty, boarded-up houses. <clears throat> All right, that's the end of chapter two. Ah, sorry for the hiccups in that. There were a few goofs. I mean, they're always kind of our... It doesn't seem to matter. I mean, like, I'll read the chapter ahead of time and look out for some goofy words that I might mispronounce or words I might trip up on just in the flow of reading, but you practice all you want. Sometimes when push comes to shove, you just goof up. <laughs> um, a little teaser. Chapter 3 is entitled Richard H. Noonan, age 51, Supervisor of Electronic Equipment Supplies for the Harmont Branch of the IIEC. Who turned him in, though? I honestly can't remember who ratted on him. Was it Richard Noonan? Did the bartender just know, maybe? Ah, that's right. He sells things to the bartender. I, You know what? Here's what I suspect. I should have gotten this sooner. He has this deal with these, who I assume are government agents from the U.S. or somewhere, to give them good shit for big money. And then he probably sells the rest to the bartender, whose name I've forgotten, Ernest. Probably Ernest just sold him out. Anyway, let's stop there for now. Um, if you're enjoying this and you like games, uh, I recommend Stalker. Um, probably the original ones like Shadow of Chernobyl and Call of Pripyat. Uh, Pipiat, probably, I don't know, unless you like old jank, uh, it might not be very appealing. Uh, I think they still, I mean, they're wonderful games, and they carry so much charm and such atmosphere. Uh, I could sit down and replay the first one for hours. Uh, but if, you know, it's not something you got into early, you might open it up and be like, what is this? I don't know how I feel about this. Um, that being said, Stalker 2 is out, and so far, I'm loving it. It's got a lot of bugs. You know, be warned, but it crushes the atmosphere. Brings me right back to the days of the first three games. Um, back when I first played them and then watched the movie by uh, Tarkovsky and then got a hold of this book, the same copy I had back in high school. Anyway, <laughs> a great movie if you haven't seen it. Um, very different from the book, so you won't spoil the book for yourself if you watch the movie. Uh, don't worry about that. Completely different premise, uh, at least in terms, I mean, not a different premise in terms of setting, uh, in terms of, like, you know, themes of the zone, but a different premise in terms of the main character and his goals and aspirations. All right, folks, thanks for hanging out. Uh, as always, um, I will be back tomorrow with Kugel. I don't know when yet exactly. I'm kind of just going to play it by ear, uh, but I'll post about it on YouTube when the time comes. Um, but yeah, thanks for hanging, and I hope you all have a great weekend, and I will catch you next time. Take it easy.